this concentration camp, the Germans starved, clubbed, and burned to death more than 4,000 political prisoners over a period of eight months. I'm Eli Rosenbaum. I've worked uh, in the Justice Department Criminal Division for 30 years now. Uh, and the work that I've done has uh, led people to uh, refer to me in, in common parlance as a Nazi hunter. When we started this work way back in 1979, the United States had an abysmal record in these cases. It had been known literally for decades that Nazi criminals came to the United States. The U.S. government had prosecuted hardly any of them, but we have been more successful in the last three decades than any other country on the face of the earth in pursuing justice on behalf of the victims of Nazi crimes. I always say our World War II cases are the ultimate cold cases. All of the crimes took place many decades ago on the other side of a vast ocean, so it's very much a search for the proverbial needle in a haystack. Over the years, we've investigated hundreds and hundreds of suspects. We have one active case, that's Yaakov Pali in New York. He served at the Travniki SS training and base camp, really a school for mass murder. And he trained on live Jews at the adjacent Travniki Jewish labor camp. And in the end, everyone who was held there was massacred. We got his United States citizenship revoked. We won an order of deportation, but none of the three countries to which he was ordered alternatively deported back in 2004, has yet agreed to take him. Yaakov Pali still lives in New York City. It's really an outrage. The Justice Department has been trying to deport you, and I wanted to talk to you about that. The John Demiano case is one of the most important cases that we brought, and I'm sure it's the best known of our Nazi cases. Demianyuk took part in the mass killings perpetrated at the Sobibor death camp in Nazi-occupied Poland during World War II. He was deported to Germany and in 2011, following a full trial, was convicted on 28,000 counts of accessory to murder. Time and again, the best evidence against our defendants has been one or another captured Nazi document that they themselves signed. In the case of Alexandra Slalekis, we had extraordinary incriminating documents. I had questioned Slalekis myself, and he denied having participated in anything related to the Jews. Uh, once again, Mr. Slalekis, the government exhibit 10 is an order that you issued, is it not? But one of our brilliant staff historians found in archives documents signed by Lelakis sending Jews to the killing squad where some 50,000 Jewish men, women, and children were shot to death. I think the Michael Kohlenhofer case was the most unexpected development in our cases. Reporters went out to interview him and he came out with a gun through his front door and actually began shooting at reporters. When Kohlenhofer was then rushed by the police, he looked up at them and in his broken English said what turned out to be the last words he ever uttered. In broken English he said, what for you shoot me, I not Jew. So I guess old habits die hard. We still pursue justice in the Nazi cases, in large part because there are still survivors of Nazi barbarism. It's not fair that survivors in our country should have to share their adopted homeland with their former tormentors, and in some cases, the killers of members of their families. There is the so-called biological solution, as Simon Wiesenthal used to say, to the cases of fugitive Nazi criminals. We are, as we have been for decades really, in a race against the Grim Reaper, and increasingly the Grim Reaper wins. The most important reason 
to continue pursuing justice in the Nazi cases is to send a message to the would-be perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity in the future that what remains of the civilized world will pursue them for as long as it takes, even if it takes the rest of their lives, and even if they flee thousands of miles uh, to places like the United States.